So, welcome back. We have been looking at description logic or description logics and let us look at uh, some statements we can make in description logics. So, remember that description logics are logics of noun phrases. So, basically they allow us to describe noun phrases essentially and uh, of course, relations between concepts um, when we move on to sentences essentially. But when we are talking about concepts, we can say for example, that eager students is the intersection of those who are eager and those who are student essentially. Basically, it is an intersection this thing. This is a union buses or cars we can say by saying if we know the concept, if we have the concept of bus, if we have the concept of car, then we can define a concept of buses or car. If we have things which are electric, we can say not electric essentially. So, this is semantic in the sense that we are defining primitive concepts and we are defining new concepts from primitive concepts. Simply saying in first order logic that we have a predicate called eager student x does not mean anything. In first order logic, uh, a predicate name is meaningless essentially in that in the sense that the interpretation depends upon you. What do you mean by that predicate? What particular subset of the domain you are talking about? But in description logics, we define some primitive concepts and then define new concepts in terms of those concepts. And we assume that the primitive concepts are defined in some namespace. So, if, if so, it should be clear to anyone who is reading that uh, document as to what, what is it we are talking about. So, the meaning of a predicate or a concept still comes from the user essentially in some sense, except that the idea is in using RDF is to have a shared vocabulary and that is the key essentially that everyone knows that what is it that we are talking about. So, if you wanted to say the set of people, let us say people are the ones who own cars or the set of individuals who owns only electric cars, then we can use the for all owns and this is the class from which the whatever they own comes from essentially. If you want to say a person who owns electric cars, that means at least one electric car the person has. So, first of all, it must be a person and there must be at least one electric car that the person owns. Someone who owns something that has a battery. So, owns something. So, that something corresponds to this concept here and that something is something that has a battery. So, it has a part which is a battery. So, we can we had said that if you use the statement that uh, I am defining a concept car as a subset of this concept. This concept is says that it has at most four wheels and sorry at, at least four wheels and at most. So, this is at most. So, at most four wheels and at least four wheels then we can define it, but we cannot really use it, uh, but we cannot say that something is a car. We can say that I am defining this concept car which has exactly four wheels, but on the other hand if we say equivalence, then we are saying that cars have four wheels and also the things with four wheels are cars. So, we are defining a two way relationship here and in that sense now we have defined what is a car. You show me some description and I can 
say that yes this is a set car and that is what we do when we do in this process of kind of classification essentially you define a concept using other concepts and then you know where it sits in the taxonomy so if you want to say students attend lectures so the right hand side here says the set of individuals who at least attend who attend at least one lecture basically and students are basically those people who at, attend at least one lecture lectures are those things which are attended by students so it's the inverse of the attendance rule basically and that lectures and students are disjoint can be said using this relation you can say that the domain of attendance role is students essentially so this is all the individuals who attend something and students belong to that concept of things that we att attend something essentially likewise for range range of attend roles is lecture so we take the inverse rule and use a similar statement to say that a lecture is something that is attended by someone we can also say that attends the range is always a lecture that you attend only lectures we have already talked about inverse rules so has parent is inverse of has child we also spoken about grandchild so has child composed with has has child as a grandchild so you can think of this as is a in some sense because you are saying for all x something 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 implies something else essentially those with grandchildren who are all doctors we can say it either by saying all those individuals who have a child who have a child who is a doctor essentially or we can say all those individuals who have a grandchild who is a doctor essentially remember that they don't have to have children essentially but if they had a children then all the children would have a children but they don't have to have and if they had then it would be a doctor so you just need to you know sort out what i just said but essentially what i was saying was that it can be vacuously true either at this level or at this level essentially but if the child exists then the child better be a doctor this simply says that at most two grandchildren brothers are siblings sisters are siblings it's a sub role that we have already spoken about we can say that the sibling role is symmetric by saying that the inverse role is also the same role essentially or its transitive is that if you compose the sibling role then you will have another has sibling role but you can also be careful and say that uh, it's an irre irreversible so irreflexive uh, rule essentially that you can't be your own sibling essentially so let's just make a mention of the fact that when we talk about logic in general we are talking about the open world assumption and which is also true for description logic essentially so supposing we make the statement that lucy likes apples and oranges and there is no other information about her likes and dislikes can we conclude 
that she likes only fruits. So, we know that she likes apples, we know that she likes oranges, but does that mean that she likes only fruits? It really depends upon, the answer to this really depends upon whether you are working with an open world assumption or whether you are working with a closed world assumption. So, if the inf information is stored in a database, then the query lists those who like only fruits will return Lucy. That is because of the closed world assumption which says that we know everything that we could know about Lucy essentially. So, remember it is the language prologue that we studied essentially. That also uses the closed world assumption and we had this notion of negation by failure there essentially. So, the similar thing applies to this here. But if we say in logic that Lucy likes only fruit or description logics, this will not return true and we will see uh, this when we look at the reasoning algorithm for uh, description logic later. So, our data database works with a snapshot of the data and assumes that a snap snapshot is complete. So, we know everything that is needs to be known. Whereas, FOLDL looks at all possible worlds that there can be things that we have not mentioned there and uh, it could be possible that she likes for example, mobile phones essentially. We have not mentioned it here, but it is possible essentially. So, a statement like Lucy likes only fruits would be false in such a case. We will also look at uh, something called default. Uh, uh, reasoning as we go along, uh, where you can draw conclusions even in an open world scenario, but the conclusions can be revised later and such conclusions are called defeasible conclusions. So, we will stop here and then look at the reasoning method that we use in description logic and that the reasoning method is known as the tableau method. We will do that in the next session.